uh, Sandy Weil here to talk with us, who is, um, keynote is entitled, My Life in Business and Philanthropy. I'm sure uh, by reputation, many of you know um, Sandy. He's one of the most respected and influential people in business over the last five decades. And he will talk about with us about his career in the financial industry, culminating in help, helping build and lead Citigroup. He will also talk about the approach he and Joan, his wife of 61 years, have taken towards their global philanthropy, including transformational gifts to Cornell University and to Weill Cornell Med Medicine, among other institutions and organizations. He'll also talk about the role Co Cornell has played in shaping his life story. Sandy is class of 55. He's the parent of a Cornell um, a Cornell student class of 81, and the grandparent of a Cornell student class of 13. He's chairman emeritus of Citigroup, CEO of Casa Rosa Ventures, and a philanthropist. Sandy is a Brooklyn native, and his wife, Joan, both now spend more than half of their time in Sonoma, where he can be found relaxed in jeans, attending local wine country social events, or riding his John Deere farm vehicle across his property to visit with the neighbors. Please join me in welcoming Sandy. Thank, thanks very much for that uh, great introduction. And uh, let me, uh, I see why you had your hand over your eyes. Um, but um, just a little bit about what the John Deere tractor does uh, that, uh, that I want to brag about. We have, it was very hard to find a place to live out here with, that doesn't have any grapes. Uh, so we have seven acres of Syrah grapes. And there was no way we could make any money doing this. So I think we did a really great deal, which could be a business model for people in the future. We found a great young winemaker, and we did a deal where he pays for all the farming, and he has two obligations to us. One is to make us proud of the wine he makes, and second, to give us some free wine. <laughs> and the first, I just want you to know, our 2013 Syrah, uh, which we make three different ways, like they make in the Northern Rhone. Robert Parker tasted it in August, and in his October uh, Wine Spectator, um, uh, Wine Advocate, I'm sorry, report, we got a 99 on one and two 100s. And I, I, I don't know anybody <laughs> <laughs> that's gotten two 100s on a Syrah made in, in Sonoma County. So uh, if, if any of you live in New York, you can get it at uh, Ralph Lorenz Polo Bar or Marea. And if you live out here, you got to go to the French Laundry. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, I just want to tell you a little bit uh, about myself. Uh, uh, I did lousy, really, in grade school. And my parents, uh, when, when my parents moved back to New York, they uh, sent me away to military school in Peekskill, which is 60 miles north of New York. And I really learned a lot of discipline, and uh, it was a very, very good experience for me. But it was a tiny little school. We had 35 kids in our graduating class, and I did really well in math and science. And it was around the point in time where people were talking about space travel, and I thought it would be a good idea, since I was so good in math and science, to uh, go to an engineering school. And uh, well, I got into Harvard, but they didn't have engineering, and I got into Cornell, and they did. So I picked metallurgical engineering, which is going to be all these new metals and whatever, and should be very, very exciting. Well, I found out I was, wasn't so exciting competing against some of these kids that went to Bronx School of Science. <laughs> and by Thanksgiving of my freshman year, it was obvious that I made a major mistake. <laughs> and I was not nearly as good in math and science as I thought. And Cornell, to its credit, Whoops. Uh, that year created a program called the Unclassified Division, for <laughs> <laughs> which meant you were on probation. Uh, but you, you, if you can go and switch into another course that you could have gotten into, and you realizing that you made a mistake and you had a year to get out of probation. So I did that, and I went to liberal arts, and I majored in government and finance and economics. And uh, 
that turned out to be a good thing, except one of the best things that happened to me at Cornell is in my senior year, I double registered in the business school. And uh, my parents, my father left my mother in the middle of my senior year when, uh, uh, during exams, and my mother really couldn't take care of herself well and didn't know where he went, so I left school and uh, went to try and find my father and, and try and work something out uh, financially so that she would be able to, uh, to live. And uh, I came back to school and I had uh, an incomplete in the course, but my advisor told me that I had way too many credits, more than enough credits to graduate, and I didn't have to make up that course, which was in cost accounting. So I, I, my wife and I, are, my wife, my current wife and I are engaged, uh, and we go to my graduation with her parents, who really didn't like me anyway. <laughs> and I find out that the business school changed their mind and couldn't recommend me for having successfully completed this course because I had an incomplete, and therefore I got no no diploma. So they were sure they were right that I was the wrong person, and. Uh, they wanted to break up this relationship, but, but I stayed over and, uh, and Joan stayed with me. They didn't like that either. Uh, and, and I took the exam on a Monday and, and I found out that I passed the course on Thursday. But in Cornell's wisdom, the next time they gave out a diploma was in September. So, and that was a year after I had uh, taken my previous physical to uh, become a lieutenant uh, in the Air Force as a pilot, which if I had done that, I probably wouldn't be speaking to you today because I don't know how to use a computer and it's all about that and uh, it would not have been a, a good experience either. But anyway, uh, I didn't graduate. I didn't go in the Air Force. Uh, by the time my draft board in Brooklyn found out that I wasn't flying, they called me down for, uh, for a physical and uh, I went down and uh, I got deferred as a father because uh, uh, my wife was six months pregnant, so I know, I know about the right to life. Uh, but I saved three years. I had my military experience in high school. Cornell saved me from being a pilot, and I got a job making $150 a month working for Bear Stearns. My wife was making more money than I did working two days a week as a teacher, and somebody taught her math and she knows about compound interest, and she claims I still owe her money to this day, and she's probably, <laughs> <laughs> and she's uh, probably right. So that's really, you know, how I started. I think uh, I was very lucky twice. Uh, my first career in business was uh, I, I started working in the back office uh, at Bear Stearns, uh, and I worked as a margin clerk, and I I got to learn the business before really computers, and. Um, uh, when they found out I wasn't going in the Air Force and I asked them, do you think I could be a salesman in this business? They thought yes. And, uh, uh, and to make a long story short, in 1960, four of us started a tiny little company with about $120,000 uh, of equity. And over the next 20 years, we grew that company to be the second largest company in, in the securities business after Merrill Lynch. We felt the world was going to change. and the securities industry had to move away from partnerships and really become part of the establishment. So we thought about who would be our best partner. And in 1981, we sold our company to American Express for a billion dollars. In 1983, I became president of the American Express Company, which I thought was a pretty good thing for a kid from, from Brooklyn. And in 1985, I decided to leave there because I had a difference of, uh, in management uh, style from uh, the person who was the chairman, who still is a very good friend of mine. And uh, <clears throat> I, l I left to not knowing what was going to happen next, but uh, you know, American Express stock for the, for the four years that I was there uh, tripled, so uh, I did OK. And uh, we, I started looking for something else to do. Jamie Dimon, who worked for me, was a very loyal guy. And he wanted to go with me, even though American Express wanted him to stay. But he, he felt this is what he wanted to do. I said, Jamie, you were voted most likely to succeed in business school. How the heck can you be going with an older guy? You know, I don't have to work again another day in my life. 
but he did it and we found eventually a little company in Baltimore called Commercial Credit, which had a single B credit rating, which is not good when you're in the financial business. You have to have an investment grade rating in order to be able to borrow money so you can lend money. Uh, so we started with Commercial Credit in, in 1986. The company was making $16 million after taxes. We raised enough money on the public offering to have the rating agencies give us a triple B rating so we were able to go to the commercial paper market. And uh, uh, 12 years later, our company was called Travelers through several uh, different uh, uh, mergers, including uh, one we bought uh, the, our Shearson company, which we sold to American Express back from, from them, which uh, really gave us a big position again in the, uh, in the securities business. And in 1998, uh, Travelers and Citicorp merged to form Citigroup, which at that time was the biggest merger of any two companies in any industry. The company was earning $6 billion a year after taxes in 1998. I retired as CEO in 2003. The company was making $19 billion after taxes. We had a rule for our top people that nobody could sell any of their stock until they retired. The only thing they could do was give a certain percentage of the stock away every year to charity because we wanted people to really get involved in helping make the world a better place and we felt it was very important that people do that. And while I was running uh, this company, which uh, at, the, at, a, at a time became the most respected financial company in the world and one of the 10 most respected uh, companies in any industry, uh, according to Fortune magazine, I was chairman of Carnegie Hall I was chairman of the National Academy Foundation. I was chairman of what, became, what is now Wild Cornell Medicine. And my wife was chairman of Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. And people tell me that, you know, I go to CEOs and they should get involved in this and that and the other thing. And they say they're too busy, they got, and they, they feel they're satisfying everything by putting some money in a foundation, somebody else runs it, and they really don't get involved. And philanthropy is not really just about giving money. It's really about having a passion for something, giving of your time and brain power, that the brain power that helped you do so well that you, as you're doing in the private sector, that is really, really important in, in, in working with the public sector and what, was, what became called private-public partnerships. And now more than ever, we really, really need the involvement of, uh, of American companies and CEOs because none of our governments have any money. And if they do have any money, they're so far behind in pension obligations, in, in, in medical obligations, that the money is gonna be taken away from a lot of different things like we're seeing it now taken away from the arts. Uh, uh, the, the NIH funding has really been held back, which is really very important to our, our country and, and the future of science. Uh, and a lot of other things. So I, I really spend a lot of my time uh, working to uh, uh, get people to really believe that we have an obligation to really give back to our communities and to help institutions do better. And I've been very, very lucky to, uh, uh, to have gotten involved uh, in, uh, in uh, Wild Cornell Medicine in 1982, going on the board and uh, in 1995, I became the chairman. My first 15 years on the board of the company, of Wild Cornell Medicine, Cornell hated the medical school. The, the, our hospital, New York Presbyterian, sued uh, Mr. Rhodes for, for not playing well with them. It was really a miserable opera, opera organization. We had five deans in 15 years, each one worse than the previous one. And the last one, can you imagine, was a psychiatrist who felt that the glass was half empty and he didn't like raising money. So when he, when he left, we, we were lucky enough to hire really a terrific uh, person who ran the Department of Medicine uh, by the name of Tony Gatto. And he and I and, and the board over the next 15 years raised over $3 billion to really 
transform that institution. And uh, I think now everybody from Cornell should really be proud of what uh, while Cornell is doing. The, with their research is second to none. Our clinical services is the best in the city. We have an institution that was profitable all through the, from 2008 through the present time, uh, which helped uh, us get through the ratings problems that we, that we had. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, we ha it's a business now that's over $2 billion in revenues. We, we raise about 30% of the money that all of Cornell University raises. Um, and uh, it's something I think that you all should be really proud of. But what, uh, what my wife and I decided to do about seven years ago now is we had spent about 55 years working in New York. And uh, uh, we got older, our friends got older. Uh, a lot of them moved to Florida. Uh, they don't like paying taxes uh, or, or for whatever reason. Some of, them, uh, some of them died. Some of them weren't exciting anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about reinventing our life, and we didn't know anybody out here in California. And we moved out here, and uh, all of a sudden we found that uh, you know, our friends are 50, 40, 30 years younger than we are. I mean, it's really terrific. And uh, we've made mistakes that they haven't even thought of making yet. <laughs> and so I think we really can be helpful. And while you know, I'm, I'm not on Facebook or any of those kind of things, and I don't know how to use a computer, and I, and I don't know how to send email, uh, which saved us billions of dollars, by the way, when I was the CEO, not being able to do email. <laughs> uh, but we moved, we moved out here, and uh, we met a lot of uh, very terrific people. And uh, so we started doing some of the same things uh, in California that we worked on in New York. We helped uh, finish and build what, what is arguably one of the best uh, uh, music venues in the country or the world, uh, modeled after the Ozawa Hall in Tanglewood, only 10 years newer and better. We, we brought great. Uh, uh, artists to come out there, helping put the school on the map. And uh, we recently retired as, uh, as chair and co-chair of that and, uh, and are spending a lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of time out here. We got very involved in UCSF and the neurosciences and are working on doing collaborative things between uh, uh, Weill Cornell and what UCSF is doing in the neurosciences and maybe in, in other parts of uh, what we do because we really don't compete with each other. Um, my, my program in education, about 1980, I started a program called National Academy Foundation when a lot of companies uh, were thinking about, financial companies were thinking about moving their offices out of New York because they had a lot of turnover and they didn't know where the employees were going to come from. And yet, when you drove around the five boroughs of New York, you saw all these kids in the streets with no clue about what life was about. We were teaching uh, vocational kinds of things of businesses that were in New York in the 19th century, not the 20th century, let alone thinking about the 21st century. And so we started uh, a public-private partnership with uh, uh, the private sector ourselves uh, the head of the New York City public school system is a guy by the name of Frank Macchiarola, and the teachers union who supported this whole program and supported teachers going to and getting summer internships, which they call externships, uh, so that they can learn something about what they're teaching. And, and we can get these kids to have mentors, get summer internships, and show them that there's something beyond that entry level job. And over the next 37 years, this has grown from one school in Brooklyn. We now have uh, 765 school, schools with 97,000 kids. 75% of these kids are on meal programs. We have five career-themed academies now, a lot of them where the jobs are, like health sciences are, is our newest one. The one before that in 07, we started engineering. 
1999, we started information technology, and we have our first two, which was hospitality and tourism and financial services. Uh, the, the, w when somebody starts in our program in the ninth grade and stays till their senior year, 87% of those ninth graders graduate. And of the kids in their senior year, between 96 and 98% graduate from high school and 92% of them are going on to further education and they have ideas of what they want to do. We have about 5,000 uh, board members in the local communities and about 3,500 companies uh, supporting this project with internships and, uh, and mentorships and uh, we really have come up with something that's replicable and, and really has grown dramatically. Uh, uh, and so what uh, I'm trying to do is recognize that, but our model is really the old fashioned model because we're teaching the same way t teaching has always happened, which you know really relates to teaching to the lowest common denominator in the class. So you lose a lot of the better uh, students and you lose a lot of uh, kids that can go faster. And, uh, and Facebook has worked on a new uh, uh, methodology uh, with a, a company called Summit Academy uh, Group uh, to really let kids go at their own pace, uh, whether it's a slower pace or a much faster pace. And it, this is a program that really, really works. So we're talking about how we can do something together and take what we have, which relates to uh, nearly 100,000 kids, they have about 5,000 in their program, and really talk about maybe really changing you know, how teaching takes place so that our country doesn't have to be not in the top 20 in the, the quality of uh, high school education, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and really get something for our money, because we spend more money per student than any place else, but the results are not there. So uh, basically, my wife and I are having a phenomenal time uh, on both coasts, and we spend time on, on we, you know, we can never leave what we have in New York, whether, you know, whether it's uh, Cornell University or Wild Cornell, or uh, I've loved uh, my opportunity working with the Tech Campus uh, uh, and listening to the mayor talking about creating another Silicon Valley. And I used to tell David Scorton, I mean, we don't have a chance to win this thing. You know, we, we got to hope that he picks two, two, two schools to do this because, you know, the last thing that Cornell really worked on and, and really created that was successful was the Ithaca Gun Company in 1850. How do we, <laughs> how do we compete with Stanford? And, and the Technion had a similar kind of problem where it's owned by the Israeli government they wouldn't let them bring any money here, and they wouldn't let their Nobels come here for more than a day at a time. Uh, so Technion didn't have a chance either, but Cornell and Technion together can more than match up with, with Stanford. And, uh, and then, uh, then we had this wonderful $350 million gift which paid for the first part of the construction, and, uh, and Stanford felt uh, you know, that maybe uh, there's too much asbestos in this building that has to come down, and the asbestos rules in New York are very bad. So they backed out of the thing, because the, and just to tell you the facts, this is like a $3 billion or more construction job over the next, uh, you know, 20 years. The cost of getting rid of the asbestos in the building that came down, this old, old hospital, was $12 million. And, uh, and I, and, I, and I think that what's going on in Roosevelt Island and, and at Wild Cornell and, and the rest of New York really balanced with what's happening in Ithaca is, is put Cornell in a really terrific, terrific position. So uh, that's what uh, I'm doing. You stole something uh, in naming the title of what this thing is, uh, My Life in Business and Philanthropy. I wrote a book in, uh, with another Cornelian in, um, in 2006 that made the New York Times bestseller list, and it's called The Real Deal, My Life in Business and Philanthropy, and if you buy it, thank you, but it'll never benefit me because I am so far behind in royalties that uh, it'll take many lifetimes for the publisher to get the money back that they paid us. <laughs> but, <laughs>
<laughs> but what, what I'd love to do is, uh, you know, obviously I'm very passionate and excited about, you know, what we're doing and excited about our life. And uh, I, I try to say to God every night, uh, I have a lot more to do, so take your time. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm happy to answer any question about uh, anything you want to ask. Yes. Here's coming the microphone. Oh, do you want a mic? Uh, we're a long way from Ithaca out here in California, but I think most of us want to know how we can help Cornell. And I wonder now that you've That's seen simple. seen both Money. coasts. No. <laughs> And, and that was one thing, if you have any suggestions for how Cornell would use us, if you will, as alumni more effectively perhaps than we have been uh, used. Mm -hmm. And secondly, are you seeing much difference in living in Sonoma versus New York? Oh, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd just explain it a little bit. Okay, well, you know, there's nothing like New York. It's, you know, the most exciting place in the world until you come out here, which is another the most exciting place in the world, is, but very, very different. I mean, the new ideas and whatever uh, uh, that are coming up, and uh, we, we have more things growing, and when you talk about social media it, it, and these young people and their ideas, I mean, can you imagine a person that just became 30, worth $50 billion, has said he's gonna give 99% of it away, which is really like unbelievable. And last night at a quarter to seven, he said, listen, I have to go. I gotta give my daughter a bath. And I'm saying, oh my God. <laughs> and I was nervous talking to him. I, you know, the weather out here is great. The people are very friendly. The food is phenomenal. Uh, and we have all, a lot of new friends. So it, to us, it's very different. Um, going to New York, we have, uh, you know, the heart and soul of what we've done for 55 years. And, uh, you know, so that's fun also. How can you help Cornell? By, by really caring, by, uh, uh, by getting involved, by getting involved in, in committees, by, uh, you, by your brain and, and, uh, and uh, in, in advice, because everybody can use advice and everybody and every institution can always get better. And, uh, you know, I think if we can think about how can we create enough endowment so that all of our professors know that they're gonna be okay and, and the ones that do research can spend the research and, you know, and, and really work on things so that our institution is impregnable and, and nobody can steal pieces, people from us that we really want because they, they have security. Uh, Sandy? Yeah. Uh, thank you for all that you've done for us. You probably can't see me. I'm up here to your left. I can. Uh, uh, as you think about Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island, given your familiarity with the financial services industry, what, what's sort of your personal vision of wh what that can really be for the school? Well, I think if you think about Cornell Tech and you think about the people that they have advising them, like, like Erwin Jacobs, like Mike Bloomberg, uh, like the, the chairman of Google, and, and others. I mean, they have really phenomenal advice. And, and if you go there and meet some of these young people and see the things that are being created and the kinds of uh, new companies that they're thinking about, you know, Silicon Valley does not have uh, a monopoly on brains. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, Cornell Tech, I love it from the point of view of the medical school because they don't have any wet labs. We have wet labs just across the river. So a lot of the, the new people that have come or, or will be coming are gonna want uh, uh, joint uh, uh, opportunities to work at both places. I mean, we all know and, uh, and are seeing a lot of important things that are done together be between the engineering uh, uh, people up at uh, Cornell and, and biology and biotech 
compare, coming together with what we're doing in research in the medical school, and if you add that with the graduate school on, on Roosevelt Island and, uh, and the business school opening up an outpost there, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really terrific. And, uh, and I think it helps you know, Cornell uh, get more people because it's, it's a broader array of what uh, the education that Cornell can do uh, is improved a lot. So listen, I like being with people that are smarter than I am, and uh, that's no problem in California, and it was no problem at Cornell, and, uh, and it's no problem for the Technion. They got plenty of people smarter than I am. And the Tech Campus, okay? Thank you. Thank you.